everyone, I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. People knew her as Rebecca Allen. Growing up in rural Bladen County, North Carolina, she learned how to play the piano, the flute, the bass guitar. She joined a jazz ensemble and played at Tar Heel High School. She went to UNC Wilmington, studied film, and then went off to Hollywood to chase her dreams as Beck Black. Well, when acting didn't go as planned, Beck went full tilt into a music career, and she's found success. Beck and her band released several singles and EPs and music videos that have gotten airplay on stations all across the country. But it is her latest track, Who's Gonna Save Rock and Roll, that has a real dose of star power. Beck Black, a singer, songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist. Welcome to the one-on-one -on -one with John Evans podcast. Thank you so much for having me, John. All right. The big secret I want to know, how did a young lady from White Oak in Bladen County end up getting music legend Ringo Starr to play drums on her record and on her music video? Ringo um, has been working with one of my um, engineers named Bruce Sugar for uh, 17 years since 2003. And uh, two years ago, Ringo heard a song that we had composed, which was called Who's Gonna Save Rock and Roll? And he loved it, but Ringo was working on his own album that came out last year. And, um, and Ringo said, man, this is a cool song. Uh, I don't have time to play drums on it right now, but you can totally take my drums. This is the way of the future. Like have some stems that you haven't ever used um, and which stems are files uh, in the music world and, and chop them up. That's the way of the future. And so Bruce Sugar, the engineer and I and co-writer, co-writer, excuse me, of, of the song, who's going to save rock and roll. We tried it. It didn't, it didn't really work. It, it sounded too mechanical when you're chopping up drums and, and, you know, so, um, we didn't know what we were going to do about it, but like back in January and, uh, the engineer Bruce was at Ringo's house in Malibu and somehow they started talking about the song and Ringo remembered it. He goes, you guys haven't recorded drums on that yet, mate. He goes, let's do it right now. And Ringo um, recorded um, on his drum set with his Beatles cymbals, and he did four takes. And he said, that'll be three bucks. <laughs> three dollars? Yeah. <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so that's how he started playing on the song. And that was back in January that he recorded the drums. I'm a co-producer of the track, so... Um, I am so honored to be a co-producer on a track with a Beatle, with Ringo Starr. Um, and um, so we were trying to figure out like a video or a lyric video. And I was filming a, um, a, a SAG feature film in Austin, Texas, because my band and I were supposed to play at South by Southwest this year. And South by got canceled due to coronavirus. And the odd thing is, is we were doing a film about a rock star that gets um, a virus and gets quarantined, but we were in pre-production since last November. So way before any of this happened, we were actually working with um, local news legend Judy Maggio from Austin News, because she was going to play the newscaster in our film. And surely, but it was just odd, because I got a call from Judy one day. She goes, we're going to have to start learning how to report the news from home. And, and that's just when I was like, this is going to be, this virus is bigger than any of us or we ever conceived of. And, um, and so anyways, I had some footage that I produced, um, of, um, a 1965 galaxy car driving around Austin, which was now boarded up. And Austin to me represents, uh, cause Austin city limits, it's the city of rock and roll. And so I thought, well, since this movie has been scratched, um, why not use it for a lyric video? um bruce in the engineer he called me he goes you know ringo's got this amazing camera guy and editor named brent carpenter and he's willing to edit this for you guys and um so ringo's personal editor um he edited the the whole shoot for us and um used the drone footage and i just filmed my own lips here actually with this ipad i'm on 
and sent the files over. And we did the best we could during quarantine to make a cool rock and roll video because there's so many lyrics in this song, I thought it was important for people to be able to, to process them, you know? Um, you're one of the co-writers of the song. Where did the concept come from of who's gonna save rock and roll? Um, so Bruce Sugar, um, he actually was one of my engineers on one of my songs called Red Dog. Um, and, um, and so he said, you know, I'm, I'm down with mixing this song for you, but in the future, I want you to co-write with me. And so one day I went over to his studio in Hollywood and he said, I have this song and it's called who's going to save rock and roll. But at the time it was in a different key. Um, so it was, uh, there wasn't that many lyrics there. Um, so I went in as a co-producer and said let's let's drop it like from a b flat to uh to an a flat let's let's drop it a key let's um let's let's double the melody and so he had the chorus which was who's going to save rock and roll but i went in and added this whole other mindscape um to it because rock and roll seems to be a, a dying genre a lot of people have always said for years because i've been in the the music scene um, in Hollywood for years, they said rock and roll is dead. And so that's sort of where we came up with the theme of it, saying how can we um, bring rock and roll back? How can we keep it alive? And who else than with Ringo Starr? Yeah, that's awesome. When you read that the LA Weekly says, uh, writing about Ringo's 80th birthday, he appears on the fantastic new song and video, Who's Going to Save Rock and Roll by brilliant L.A. artist Beck Black. What does that do for your confidence when something like that comes out? Um, it definitely makes me feel smart. Um, <laughs> um, I was really astonished that um, one of the main editors for L.A. Weekly, uh, Brett Caldwell, uh, quoted me as a brilliant L.A. artist. And I'm glad even though I'm originally from North Carolina. I graduated from film school at UNCW underneath Frank Capra Jr.'s program there um, that I'm considered an L.A. artist because I've been in Los Angeles for 13 years. And um, so I'm glad to to be an L.A. artist and a Carolina girl at the same time. But it really did help because um, I have to be honest with you, John, it's not been the easiest time as an artist because it, the stage is bare, the lights are dim. Um, I don't know when we'll ever be able to get back on a stage again. And um, it breaks my heart, you know? It feels like a part of me is missing because I'm not performing. And I mean, I'm, and not only as a musician, but as an actress, because just think about theater. I mean, theater might be a lost art in itself, you know? Um, so, um, I think it really gave me the confidence that I needed when LA Weekly wrote that. It, it gave me some sort of morale boost that I needed to hear because we are our own worst critic. Yeah, I know that. I've been doing it for 37 years critiquing myself as I watch uh, newscast uh, tapes and, and, and uh, playbacks. Growing up Rebecca in Bladen County, what was that like? I grew up by the Cape Fear River and um, I continue to uh, write about that river in my scripts um, that I write. I have one script named Train Jumper. Um, but growing up in White Oak, for instance, it was like all about riding bicycles and um, exploring the Cape Fear River. And um, I was in the middle of the woods. And actually, we had a peacock farm when I was growing up. And um, so it's like I had more friends that were animals than people because there wasn't many people around. Um, so um, I think it, it was a, definitely a, a, a shock when I moved to Los Angeles. But as a young child, even when I was uh, five years old, I used to always say I wanted to be an actress and I wanted to move to California. And when I went to UNCW, I graduated with a film degree, but that was to help me be a smart actress because I wanted to know every element about cameras, about how to write, how to be able to be sufficient as an artist um, holistically. And so I, when I moved to LA, I was, you know, a little country girl, a little country accent, and 
I think now that I'm back here in Bladen County for the moment, uh, my country accent definitely has come back. My friends in LA have told me that. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm glad I grew up in the country. I'm glad I got to ride bikes as a little kid, you know, wandering around. Um, I, I think it really built character, but, um, fortunately for me, I was able to travel a lot as a child. I went to Africa on safari when I was nine, I've been all over South America, I've been to Europe. And, um, so I think traveling around the world really, um, opened my eyes beyond everyday life in White Oak. Now you, if I'm not mistaken, you took piano lessons young in life. You learned how to play flute in the band, I guess, at Tar Heel High School. Uh, you've learned how to play bass guitar, you know, as a father of three kids and seeing schools and education change. There's my guitar. It, uh, oh, there you go. Cool. Uh, seeing education change, the arts is really kind of a lost art in school, but you really were introduced to it at a young age and really kind of fueled your passion to do what you wanted to do for a career, right? I trained classical piano for several years. Um, when I was 10 and um, I played classical flute. We had like a Mr. Holland's opus at Tar Hill at the time because of the embouchure of the flute. Um, he had me try the French horn um, and I did percussion. And then he said, you know, you, you have a background in keyboard, you know, you can play bass in keyboard. I was like, oh, I didn't really know that. He was like, yeah, it's what Raymond Zierich did and the doors. Um, and um, so we, I joined this jazz ensemble and we would play 25, six to four um, by Chicago yep. and, and yep. black magic woman by Santana. And um, in the middle of football games, I had two guys carrying my keyboard out to the halftime in the middle of the football field. And I would play, I would be the bass player. So um, I think that really inspired me as an artist to play bass as a keyboardist. You worked here at WECT. How did you come about getting a job here at WECT? So when I graduated from UNCW with a film degree, um, I called WECT first thing. And because I grew up watching WECT and it was a dream to me to work for WECT News. And I, um, I got an email back from Tom Cheatham and he said, come in for an interview and I did, and I worked with WCT for two and a half years, and I started out doing cameras in the studio, and then I um, became the sound mixer. And I would make the newscast really fun with different sounds and things like that, but um, I was actually the first sound mixer um, because WCT was the pilot station at the time that went from analog to digital. So um, because the, the console at WCT at the time um, was like a 1970s analog concert board. So <laughs> I was the first sound mixer at the helm for the digital newscasts. And at any point, I mean, I know you said when you were younger, you wanted to do uh, 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 music, but at any point did TV possibly enter your thought process or was this just a way to kind of make some money and then take that next step? Um, yeah, TV has been a big part of my life. Um, actually, right before I left to go to LA, I was trained to be a reporter at WECT, which maybe one day I can still be a reporter at WECT. Um, but it was like I had Hollywood, you know, in my mind. I was like, I've, I've got to go to Hollywood. And, um, and so my first jobs in, in Hollywood were working at actually Nickelodeon um, as a producer's assistant, as a production assistant. And, and then I went on to be a, um, a stunt double on Twilight, the first uh, film um, of that series. I was Kristen Stewart's double. Um, I was in front of a green screen um, in a harness doing the wire work for the flying scene. So I'm actually like, I was like the light in for that. It was like not stand in because I was flying, but I called myself <laughs> the fly in. <laughs> um, and also I did some, some stunt work on that, jumping out of a car and things like that. And, um, and so I've, I've been featured like little small bit parts on television for a while. Like last year I was on the TV show SWAT, um, as a crying hostage in a record shop. 
And um, I was on Grey's Anatomy once as a love interest, I only had one word line, which was like, thank you. Um, and so, I mean, little bit parts for years, but I'm in the Screen Actors Guild and I have been for over a decade and now I'm making my own films. So, and uh, yeah. How hard is it, Beck? You know, we have a lot of people who, who have those dreams who want to get out to Hollywood, who want to be big rock and roll stars or be movie or TV stars. But it's not easy. I've heard a lot of different stories. How many times did you come close to saying, see you later? Oh, gosh, every other day, um, it seems like that. Um, my first big break, actually, because entertainment is not easy to get into, I tell you that. and. Um, my first big break, my first SAG part was on Clint Eastwood's Changeling, and I was playing a roller skater. I had been fitted for 1930s clothes a month in advance, and um, Clint Eastwood loved me on the set. Angelina Jolie did as well. Um, I got a little too much attention the first day that the wardrobe woman took notice and decided that next morning that she needed to change my outfit several times. She said, I looked too much like the lead, um, that we were both wearing green and kept me off the set. I didn't really understand protocol at the time. And we were at Warner Brothers. We were actually shooting in the same telephone room that they did for A Star Is Born. So anyways, we were there in that telephone room and I got to set that second day and the first AD came up to me and goes, where have you been? We've been looking all over for you, Clint. Eastwood had a part for you and they gave it to somebody else. Oh. And now I think my picture's on the deleted scenes for that movie. Um, but um, so I, so you can be there, you can be right in the moment, but you never know what can happen. Um, Cause you're dealing with a lot of people's egos on the set, to be honest. I mean, I can't sugarcoat it for you. Right. Um, it, it's, it's a little difficult. Um, so I was there, I had an opportunity, Clint Eastwood wanted me to have a little part and this wardrobe woman kept me off the set and didn't even tell anybody where I was at. And, and I really, I was heartbroken after that. And after that kind of happened, um, I kind of didn't really want to be in the film industry anymore because you can have talent, you can have a degree, you can, you can be at there at the right moment, but anything can happen. And that's when I joined the music industry um, because I thought to myself, nobody can ever try to inhibit me like that again. And um, so I went full throttle into the music industry after that. You perform under Beck Black, but you also have other players in your band, correct? Right. So um, when I went to music full throttle, we were the Moonbeams. And um, we played the Troubadour and everywhere we were doing really well and my guitarist at the time he wanted to split um and he no longer wanted to play guitar because he was playing for perry farrell and um scott wyland and lots of lots of very famous acts so he was going on the road so when i called him moonbeam as a, an affectionate pet name so when he left the band, I had to rebrand ourselves and we were headed to South by Southwest in 2014. So I rebranded us as Beck Black, but I was actually the last person that wanted to be called Beck Black because I had to talk about myself in third person on stage. So it's like, we are Beck Black. Um, my drummer is Adam Alt. Um, he's from a very well-known uh, drum percussion brand called Street Drum Corps, and um, my guitarist is uh, Mo Madiquin. So we've been um, touring. We actually played the Troubadour last year again, and we play the Whiskey A Go-Go quite often, um, and uh, the Viper Room was like a big place. We were like just playing on the Sunset Strip, so I'm, I'm known in L.A., but I just wish I was known you know, throughout the world because every artist wants their music to get out. Well, I've sure. been very lucky that my music's been playing on Sirius XM. Uh, Rodney Bingenheimer, he's been a radio DJ for over 40 years. He discovered David Bowie. He discovered Blondie, the Ramones, and he's been airing the song with Ringo Starr and I, uh, who's going to save rock and roll for six consecutive weeks. Um, also, Joe Walsh from the Eagles was supposed to play it a couple weeks ago. Um, cause he's actually Ringo's brother-in-law. They're married to sisters. Right. Um, actually today for Ringo's big birthday, uh, Joe will be on there, Paul McCartney. 
and that will be airing um, at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. our time today. But uh, to answer your question, Beck Black is a trio, but Beck Black is also a brand. I, in addition to doing rock music, I'm also um, starring an adventure with country. And I just recorded um, an EP called Electric Cowgirl in Nashville, Tennessee, and in New York City nice. last year. Nice. So you're Thank branching. You. So you're branching. Out. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the the whiskey a go go, the Viper Room. I mean, these are legendary places where, you know, big time rock and roll acts have played and and come and gone. When you walk into a place like that, does it lift your performance level? Do you say Motley Crue was on this stage, Van Halen was on this stage, U2 played here, The Doors played here? Or do you just have to go out there and say, look, I'm Beck, this is who I am, this is what you're going to get? Is there any of that awe as you walk in and get on stage? Oh, yeah, you can feel it. I mean, just walking into some of those places, you can really feel the energy there. Um, the Trivador really is an interesting place. So is the Whiskey Go Go. Um, one of my favorite bands growing up was The Doors. Um, while I was riding my bicycle around White Oak um, in the middle of the woods, I was listening to The Doors. So playing at the Whiskey Go Go was a very big accomplishment for me. Um, and that was actually my last gig last year in August was at the Whiskey Go Go. Besides doing some festivals. Um, but at a venue and um, I'm part of this ultimate jam fam. Um, so we get together and you don't even get to rehearse. You're with all the pros playing. You have to go on stage cold knowing what you're doing. And um, so I do that quite often. Um, I did do a benefit a couple years ago um, to help uh, Mexico at the time. Um, there was like an earthquake there a couple years ago, so we did a big benefit. I actually asked my friend Corey Feldman to join us. Um, I hired a mariachi band, and we raised thousands of dollars um, to benefit Mexico and bring water there. And then I did a benefit for Puerto Rico after that. So, um, But one of the most rewarding things isn't just walking into the room where a lot of greats have played, is actually you can help other people with music and with performing mm -hmm. and and that's the best feeling of all for those of you who uh, are out there and have not heard of Beck Black go to beckblack.com you can see a lot of videos and you know back 2014 South by Southwest helps you start releasing the single Life's a Circus and Rock On in 2014 American Mr. in 2015 then your EP came out with Red Dog, which is a great music video of you in that pink car Thank you. coming up in the desert over that little red dog. Uh, I, I saw that again today. Uh, Thank you. You're, you're, you're described almost like as, as Susie and the Banshees, I guess, is one of the things that I saw. But as I looked at it, I got more of a Blondie kind of thing from you. Yeah. And, and that's because, I mean, Blondie in the 70s when I was growing up, you know, Blondie was the first one that did the rap, and then she did The Tide is High and some of these other things. And, and that's what I get when I see a lot of your stuff. What do you get when you see a lot of your stuff? Or what's a compliment to you when somebody says, hey, you're like, or hey, you're like? Um, when people tell me, I remind them of David Bowie. Because um, actually, I did a benefit for LGBT um, for Pride Month last year, and I performed Heroes by David Bowie at the Whiskey Go Go, and that was to help the Trevor Foundation against bullying. And um, so, when people compare me to David Bowie, and to know that one of the you know most well-known radio DJs in the world, Rodney Bingenheimer, formerly of K Rock FM, now Sirius XM. Channel 21, uh, Stephen Van Zant's Underground Garage. Um, when people say I remind them of David Bowie, um, some sort of quality of me, that that is a huge compliment. Blondie is a very huge compliment. Um, back in January, I recorded with her drummer, Clem Burke. We did a, um, a cover of Joy Division's Level Tears Apart, but we did it country. So um, some producers flew me out to LA um, because they wanted true country right? Bladen County yeah. to come out there and um, sing uh, Level Tears Apart with the lead singer of Drama Rama, John Easdale. And uh, he had a very popular band in the 90s. So working with Clem is, is such an honor. Uh, the drummer of Blondie, he's been with her since the 70s. Um, and um, well, I'll tell I you think the, another... The, so, the hmm? one that I think you really 
come across as a country performer is Don't Call Me Darling. That's the yeah. one that, that for most of yours, most of your videos and songs, you are kind of in my face. You're going to like me or you're not going to like me. But Don't Call Me Darling is that country-esque. It almost reminds me of that 60s and 70s kind of a stuff with a little bit of a, a smirk, a little bit of a, right. you know, a, 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 Tongue in a cheek. face. Yeah, but yeah. it shows me that you can do a couple of different kinds of styles. Thank you. Yeah, I work with a company out of Austin, Texas called Warm Audio Microphones and one of their featured artists. And I sent them, um, don't call me darling, I had a demo of it. And they said, you should go to Nashville. We're going to um, have a bunch of amazing musicians, session musicians, such as Jeff King, who's uh, Reba McIntyre's guitarist. And he's playing on the track. And we went to um, Barry Hill in Nashville, which is a very famous studio section. And I did that song. And then the owner of Warm Audio Microphones loved the country song so much. He says, let's have Beck write four more. And instead of going to Nashville, I thought, I'd rather just do country in New York City. I know that sounds odd, but um, because I'm a multi-instrumentalist, um, I worked with an engineer named Dante Latanzi, and we together played all the instruments and um, were our own sort of country band, and we created the EP Electric Cowgirl, which I'll be releasing soon um, with tracks like He Won't Leave, uh, Gotta Get Back to My Baby Again, which I did a music video in Manhattan last year, last fall. And um, that's why I actually dye my hair dark. Um, so it's kind of like rock country. Um, these are actually my natural roots. Um, so well, your natural um, roots are in Bladen County too. So uh, so it's yeah, kind of, kind yeah. of ironic as you're doing the interview today. I know you're working right. on Train Jumper, your screenplay. Uh, you've already talked about yes. the Electric Cowgirl coming out. What else are we going to hear now that uh, the uh, the Ringo Starr? record is out and uh, some of the other things you have where else are we going to see back black in 2020 um hollywood boulevard's coming out it's a nine song album um which i actually re-recorded life's a circus i made more of a classical intro to that um there's several songs on that one i should send it to you it's it's gonna be a really cool rock album hollywood boulevard the the title track's already playing on sirius xm um, I gave it to Rodney Bingenheimer as a gift, even though it's not out yet, because he's like, you got to release that. And um, so um, so that will be coming out. I also have a band called Jinx. Um, I was working with Linda Perry, um, the very well famous uh, and renowned uh, producer. Um, so that's more of a pop band where I rap and do more of a Blondie thing. If you were to hear that, you definitely would say Blondie. We actually repainted the Roxy um, for the first time since the 1970s, and I came up with putting a keyboard on it. So when you drive by the rocks, you can see there's a keyboard on it. Um, I play guitar in that band, and we had two songs that were on Dump on the movie um, nice. on Netflix. And so I that we also have those songs coming out with my my secondary band Jinx. Um, so it's just like um, there's a lot of music coming out, um, so much. And I also perform and record with Tony Valentino from the Standells. Um, his song, Dirty Water, is the theme song for the Boston Red Sox. And um, so him and I, we redid uh, Ride on the Sunset Strip. I rewrote some of it to make it um, more positive in nature. And um, we have a new song coming out called Another Dimension, which is going to be very Twilight Zone. I actually have to record the vocals for that today or this week. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm recording from home. Um, thank goodness for warm audio. They sent me the equipment so I can do that. Um, I'm not a technician, even though I used to be a sound mixer for WCT, but, um, <laughs> I try my best, you know, Beck hey. reflect for me for a moment. There's really not a place that's farther from LA or Hollywood than rural Bladen County, North Carolina. There's a lot of young ladies, young boys that are in middle school who have that dream, who play, who just started playing guitar, just started playing piano, and they have that dream to want to be a rock star, or be a movie star. It's not easy, but what do you tell a young boy or a young girl today who has those dreams? As somebody who came from rural Bladen County, what do you tell them? I would tell them, to all of you 
wonderful dear artist out there that if you have a dream you can make it happen all you have to do is believe in yourself and as long as you can believe in yourself you can do anything you can come from any background from anywhere in the world even from blade and lakes elementary school where i went and i first learned how to sing from my fifth I mean, my first grade teacher she taught me about music and i was inspired from that day forward I would sing on the school bus on the little dirt road we had to ride on for 15 miles to get through the Bladen Lake State Forest. You can you can do it. it. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. As long as you have that dream and you have that love in your heart, you can go anywhere. And is that what you think about some days when it's the hardest? I have to remind myself that the industry is very tough. Um and there's something that I've been thinking about lately. It's like when, when people call you names or they try to bully you or they, whatever they try to do, whatever they say about you is actually a reflection of what they think about themselves. And that really helps because the industry is tough. Like I said, even the Clint Eastwood movie, a, a wardrobe woman keeping me off the set um, because she didn't want to see someone, you know, have a chance that day people will try to drag you down and they'll try to drag you low to their level but don't let them it's your choice don't take it personal it's like the four agreements always do your best be impeccable with your word don't take it personal and what is the fourth one <laughs> what is the fourth one um geez that must be the most important one but I know that the, the, the best thing I can say is always do your best and don't take things personal because what other people are going through, sometimes they try to put it on you and just just let it, just brush it off and keep going and, and keep your head up and, and don't let anyone ever try to tear you down because they will. But you have to be strong within your own self and foundation because with self-love, you can do anything. That's all we really want at the end of the day is to be accepted you know, so, mm -hmm. but we have to really accept ourselves first. Now that uh, your song, Who's Gonna Save Rock and Roll is out with the legendary Ringo Starr on your video and playing drums on your track, nobody can ever take that away from Rebecca from Bladen County. Thank you, John, that's right. You've actually given me some inspiration right now that you're right, nobody can take that away. And I know that Ringo loves the song. He said, Beck Black really sang her butt off. Um, and he's excited it's on the radio and because he knows Rodney's been playing it. And um, he thinks the song rocks. And I really hope that, you know, him and I are going to create more music together. Um, you know, that's in discussion right now with his engineer. And you're right. Nobody can take that away. And as long as you have a dream and you keep believing in yourself and believing in your dream, you can do anything. Beck, it's uh, good to talk to you and we wish you the very best. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, John. It's such an honor to be interviewed by you. I watch you every day. So a big thank you to Beck Black for sitting down and taking part in this week's podcast interview. If you want to learn more about her, go to beckblack.com. You can follow her on social media. She's Beck Black on Facebook. She's under Beck Black Music on Instagram. She has her own YouTube channel where you can watch all of her music videos. And you can also hear her material on Spotify and also on iTunes. Now, before we go, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please download and subscribe to the One on One with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. The more feedback we have from you, the higher we'll be listed on the apps and the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of One on One. Stay safe.